Hi, my name is George Lawton, and I'm a journalist with Tech Target, and I'm here today with Palav Agarwal, who's the director of data science at Levi Strauss, and he's going to talk to us a, a little bit today about what uh, business can do to move the needle and business performance using AI. So, what? Tell us a little bit about your job. Like, what what does it involve in like? you know, working with uh, business managers and AI scientists and other kind of components. Walk us through the process of like a typical project. Great, yeah, so a lot of our projects really start from a very critical business need, um, where that could be a specific problem that a business is facing, or through some market research, they have found out that our consumers are not satisfied with our product in some way, or the experience that they're having in a store or online. And they then come to us, the data science team, to say, hey, we have this problem, how do we solve it? And then we uh, iterate upon different solutions with them, we ideate, we define the problem statement very clearly, and then we work with them on identifying what the right solution would be that really solves the end consumer problem. And so the typical project uh, phases are problem identification by the business teams, um, problem definition with data science product and business teams uh, working together. Then we as data scientists work with product managers and UX designers to identify what is the end experience that will truly solve the problem. And then we take those as hard requirements on our side as data scientists to be this is what the final algorithm needs to be doing. And then we d try out different models, and then it's more about working with uh, data scientists and machine learning engineers and data engineers and uh, DevOps and all the technology uh, side of the house. And then we create the final solution, we, we test it out, and testing can mean very different things. Uh, for example, there is consumer testing, there is uh, performance testing, there is end user you know, testing, there's security testing, we do lots of testing. And then once we are all satisfied that this is what we want to deploy, we then push it out um, as, a, a, as an A-B test, where we only surface this experience to a certain group of the users. If we see that by the end of the A-B test that this, test, th this uh, variant performed better than the existing system, then we move forward to like, deploy it at scale. And then hence, once we deploy it, we keep tracking as to how it's doing. We keep track of the, uh, the, the analytics that are coming out of the system. And then uh, that helps us define what future developments we might want to do on this uh, system. And then we keep moving forward uh, from that, that point on. So it's a pretty cyclical process uh, where there's a lot of iteration at each step along the way. So you've been working on this for a while. Like how, how long have you been at Levi Strauss working on the data science team? And then how old is this effort? So I've been with uh, Levi's about two years, but I've been working as what I would say a data scientist for about almost a decade now. Uh, the funny thing is that about a decade ago, this was not called data science. Uh, that word didn't really exist in common parlance. It was called like statistics or research science or quant or very specific field, like already like uh, I would say industry specific terminology. So, for example, I started off as a catastrophe risk modeler, which uh, you know, again, like if you ask somebody like today, like what a catastrophe risk modeler do, most people won't really be able to answer that. Uh, but it really is what, uh, you know, in many ways similar to what data scientists do, which is about like identifying a business problem and then solving it using data. Um, and so that's kind of, I would say, uh, in terms of my background. And uh, I would say Levi's as a company, I mean, obviously it's been around for 160 years, but data uh, science is a very new field uh, in the company. And really it started about two years ago by the time that I joined the company. They really served when you joined about mm -hmm. two years ago. Yeah. So how big is your team now? Uh, so my team is about six data scientists uh, located here in the US. We have other data scientists located across the globe. And then we also have a bunch of other consultants we work with. So it's a pretty, I would say, wide team. And uh, to a certain extent, like the boundary between data analysts and data scientists sometimes blurs. Uh, depending on the problem we are working on. So I would say in total, uh, data people at Levi's would be somewhere in the order of like 20 to 30.
So how did, how did you get from a catastrophe modeling expert? I mean, how does that relate to what, what people call data science today? I mean, are there catastrophes that Levi Strauss is averting, uh, so to speak? And um, To a certain extent, yes, right? So if you think about uh, where I started off was like modeling natural and human catastrophes. So that would be hurricanes, earthquakes, and then the impact that they have on human systems. Um, and if you think about the, the work there, a lot of it is like understanding, you know, what is it that uh, the end uh, the end user who could be, let's say, a property manager or somebody who manages like a, the real estate portfolio of a, of a large client, you know, what are the kinds of risks that they are, you know, facing that they want to avoid or want to be better prepared for by, you know, better, you know, using statistical models uh, that can predict outcomes that they might not necessarily be able to do using like a simple, you know. Excel tool or like you know pen and paper calculation, and so that's really where I started off as. Back then, again, machine learning was something I was using, but it wasn't necessarily this like sexy, hyped-up word that was you know used a lot. So um, I would say like when I was working as a catastrophe modeler, like that's kind of my day-to-day -day work was like using all these much mathematical models and statistical models. And then uh, after that, I was looking for a change, and data science was starting to become a thing slowly. I was hearing about it. And then I thought, maybe it's worth a try. And so I joined a startup uh, where they were looking for somebody who could do both uh, computer programming, like software engineering, and data science. And so I started off as that, and then slowly you know, became a full-on data scientist after that. Um, I guess in terms of like companies trying to avoid catastrophes, um, so you might have heard about like Amazon's website going down during Black Friday, or Target's website going down during Black Friday, or like different retailers like facing uh, challenges when the traffic surges suddenly. And I would say those are uh, a type of business catastrophe. Um, and if you think about like you know the role of uh, the teams like that, like data science, who can predict future scenarios, like uh, you know what's the traffic going to be at a certain point of time, or how many people do we need in the warehouse to uh, to be able to fulfill all these orders. If the businesses don't get that right, then that could be a business catastrophe. The stock prices can actually, you know, be affected quite negatively, and that's I would say like where the role of data scientists can also be very critical is to like prevent those scenarios by giving people the business organizations a foresight and like be able to like to look around the corners a little bit. So it's almost like you cut your teeth in this domain of mm -hmm. you know modeling catastrophes using these various data science principles, and then machine learning came along, and so a lot of the the same kind of processes you use, right. you're applying them to other kinds of business mm -hmm. problems, and catastrophe is one of them. But right. I mean, certainly, like selling more jeans or improving the yeah. customer experience or reducing inventory, those uh -huh. are more. Uh, those are probably more common. Is that Precisely, it? yeah, exactly. And I would say, like, that would just be one area of applications. Like, I would say my my team works on both business-facing users and you know the actual end consumers. And then there's a middle ground in between where like we work with a lot of wholesalers like Macy's and Nordstrom like uh, you know who are also our consumers. Oh really? Yeah. So you're developing algorithms that aren't just consumed internally mm -hmm. or by customer facing applications but is a way of improving the the sales through your various retail channel partners. Right. Yeah. So and that's and that's really like the fun of being a, a company like Levi's is that uh, because the leadership backs data-driven transformation so wholeheartedly, pretty much every area of the business is table stakes for us at this point in terms of you know, applying you know, machine learning and data science to really uh, make processes that have existed for about 160 years now at this company to really modernize them and really transform them using the application of data science. What, what are some of the examples of the kinds of problems you've, you've worked on and the kinds of results and and maybe maybe you could spell out one that didn't work as you thought, and you know maybe you learned something from that. Absolutely. So, um, on the consumer-facing side, for example, um, our our business, like um, uh, I would say, uh, consumer insights teams, uh, when they did some consumer research, found out that there are a lot of consumers who are abandoning their carts um, uh, because they're not able to meet the free shipping threshold on the website. And meet the free shipping threshold on the website. So, like, we don't offer free shipping, you know, on just any product. Like, you have to meet a certain threshold. And so, what we were seeing was that because the consumers were not able to reach their free shipping threshold, they would abandon their cart and then go to a different website to try to, like, you know, get free shipping. And so, we did some research and found out that the reason they're abandoning their cart is not because they're not interested in the product, but because they feel that spending, like, you know, 
any amount of money on shipping is a less tangible value add as compared to spending that money on an added product. And so hence we developed a recommendation algorithm that would recommend uh, items in the cart directly where it would help the people, the consumers, reach free shipping threshold. So that, you know, let's say you're at 85 bucks, uh, you know, as your cart total, and you need 15 more do dollars to get to free shipping, then we'd recommend items which are like in that neighborhood that not only complement uh, your style and like in the products you've added to cart, but also help you reach the free shipping so that you can avoid that shipping fee. And when we deployed that, it took us about like a month to like build it and deploy it. And that gave us like a pretty, you know, noticeable uh, revenue increase and conversion increase when we deploy that algorithm. Similarly on the business side, I would say we built a model to predict uh, returns and orders uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, a month in advance. So that helps us staff our warehouses accordingly. And again, those are both like, I would say, examples of where we... Really? So there's big variations in return, such that having, having the warehouse staff on hand to manage it. Right, because returns depend upon a number of factors. Uh, so for example, if we launch a new line of product, the returns might go up or might go down. Uh, similarly, uh, for example, if we uh, have a new promotion where people buy a lot, uh, they might end up having some like, you know, regret returns, for example, and so those kinds of factors we have taken into account to staff our warehouses accordingly. And especially during like major sale periods, uh, as you can imagine, like if we sell a lot during like the Black Friday sale, uh, the returns will, if, even if they stay proportional, it will end up coming back to us at a later date. So we, ha uh, we have to sort of plan for that accordingly. And so those are all areas where I would say. Return one item on my hundred dollar order. Do I lose my free shipping? No, you don't. You, <laughs> we, we we honor your free shipping uh, <laughs> still. Um, I would say an area where it not work as well would be uh, when we were trying to uh, let's say affect uh, process changes. So, for example, as a company, like we've really been able to maintain our lead in the market by having uh, like a lot of different processes that make our business really robust. Um, and then uh, the the problem happens where. Uh, certain assumptions which were valid, let's say, 20 years ago, might not be valid today, but the process still utilizes the same assumptions. And there, when we have to go back and, you know, challenge those assumptions, we have to then, uh, you know, we have then it becomes a process of redoing the, uh, redo, like, thinking about, like, how is the entire end-to-end -end process working? And that might mean that, you know, we might have been asked to do, like, this, but to actually see the impact, we have to, like, overhaul this entire process. And that's where I would say data science becomes less important because then it might be like, you know, uh, it might give you efficiency in, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, at, in the beginning of the process. But by the time the process comes to fruition, the advantage that you got from data science is probably like, pretty much always already like you know disappeared. Why is it? Is it is it because of it's a larger process, or is it because there's like people involved and you have to change their behavior? across all of these different steps to make it more useful or a little bit of both? Precisely, yeah. I think uh, it's, it's all of the all the above that you mentioned. Um, the thing is, like, a lot of fashion, if you imagine, ha has, uh, there's, a ten there's a sense of, uh, you know, using numbers to make better decisions, but there's also a lot of intuition and uh, I would say there's a lot of the art of, you know, understanding what the fashion trends are and, like, you know, what should be sold to whom. There's a lot of, like, business constraints that have to be taken into account. And let's say just by producing a better forecast of how many products are we going to sell, we might not necessarily be able to uh, reflect that as to what gets allocated to a specific store because there might be other constraints at play. And so uh, a lot of times that requires uh, really like introspecting on like what, uh, what piece of the end-to-end -end process needs to change before data science can really be a meaningful addition to the overall process. What have you been learning about pushing out better metrics to people, like Sorry, across the, like pushing out better KPIs and metrics mm -hmm. for people to understand, you know, what to track and how to make uh, this information available in such a way they, they can make better decisions? Right, so a lot of it, I would say, starts with uh, understanding the user's needs. And I would say that's where we start, you know, with every project which is that when we go to the consumer, uh, the end user, let's say, it could be a business user or it could be a consumer, uh, we go through a process of empathy work where we try to really understand what is the pain point that we, can, that we are trying to solve for you. And a lot of times it's about you know, an intangible thing, like for example, the consumer is having a better experience. Now what does that mean? 
And so a lot of times it's about uh, looking at what is it the what is the broader uh, expectation that we're meeting, and then what kinds of metrics can be good proxy for that expectation. So for example, if we say consumers are able to find products fast, like are having a better experience like finding products, that might mean that uh, they are going to fewer product pages, they're looking at fewer products, or for example, one of the uh, instances is where um, all, all the consumers like on the web on, on our on our website they tend to uh, read reviews before they buy a product. Uh, now, because we we are Levi's, like you know, and everyone around the world wears us, we get thousands of reviews on products. Now, people are not going to like spend a half a day reading through all the reviews to understand whether this suits them. And so then it's a matter of like, how can we create the right review summaries using natural language processing and using uh, you know uh, information retrieval algorithms to, uh, to to really surface the most meaningful insights at the very top, which might mean that we cut down on the browsing time and people can get to uh, what they're looking for faster, and people can get to the piece of information they're looking for you know without having to browse through everything themselves. And so those KPIs can then often mean like. You know, browse time, time spent on a on a product page, uh, number of clicks to get to an add to cart. So we then refine those as very specific KPIs, and then eventually, obviously, those I would say are the short-term KPIs. Then there's a long-term KPIs like, you know, what is our sell-through rate? What is our revenue per visitor? What is our uh, you know return consumer transaction rate, etc. So we track both short-term metrics and long-term metrics to really see how effective our algorithms are at like making the users life better. And then when you like introduce a new algorithm, you have like a range of these KPIs to look at and say, well, it 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 caused an increase over on this KPI, but not as not as a big a one over here, which is where we thought. But this is pretty good. Right, and that's that always happens all the time, right? Where um, and that's like you know part of the fun of working in data science is that you know. Um, Let's say we build a, uh, so, and this is an example that happened thus is that we were trying to build a, a more intelligent audience segmentation model where we were thinking about, you know, we do a lot of email marketing where we send out marketing emails to consumers, but not all consumers engage equally with all emails. So who should get what email was one of our algorithms that we were trying to build. And so when we were building the algorithm, like one of the KPIs we were tracking was revenue per email sent. So for each email that we're sending, what's the revenue that we're getting out of it? And because our model was so hyper-focused on increasing that metric, it ended up doing uh, sort of a more of a blanket email send. Because turns out, the more emails you send, the more revenue you generate. But at the same time, the unintended quantum consequence of that was that we started also seeing higher unsubscribe rates amongst our unsubscribe e rates in our from our consumers because we were doing a more blanket send. And so then we said, oh, okay, we need to now put another constraint in our model by looking at this other KPI. And generally, I would say that's where a lot of the iterations uh, come in in designing a model, is to design an algorithm that meets a specific need, launch it, run an A-B test, see what other metrics are being affected, and then bring those in as an objective for our, for our model training. And so in a lot of ways, like, data science becomes a, a process of, you know, almost all algorithm development becomes a process of optimization where there is like a pretty strong input from UX designers, product managers, business stakeholders, data engineers, because everyone has their own KPIs. And we can't expect that only our KPIs, like model accuracy, will be taken at the, as, as the most important KPI. Everyone's KPIs are important. And how do we incorporate all KPIs into the model is a very interesting challenge that I would say most companies and most data scientists are dealing with today. It's almost like a practical example of Bostrom's paperclip uh, scenario. S but similar, here yeah. it's not the whole world. It's right. just like you create some kind of wreckage right. on uh, like your subscriber list right. by, by an overambitious model. Right. And I think that's a lot of what you know AI is. Like, you know, the reason we need to make our machines artificially intelligent is because they're naturally stupid. And the thing is there's a lot of context that we as humans possess that a machine does not. So I think in Boston's like paperclip example, if the machine is optimized to just produce paper clips all day, every day, that's what it'll care about. It won't it will not care about, you know, exhausting the earth's resources of like of aluminum, for example. And so I think putting those constraints in and like, you know, and that's where like a lot of the art comes in, a lot of the design comes in.